Hey, I'm Brian with the HVACR School podcast and HVACRschool.com. Today, we're going to be replacing a piston with a TXV on an R410A system that currently has a piston in place. We're going to demonstrate what's good about a TXV, why it works well, and we're also going to show you the Danfoss kit that you can get for replacing TXVs in a lot of different applications. So here we go. So one nice thing about the TR6 kit is that it fits really nicely in a van. Like it's really easy. It's a store and you've got three different sizes of expansion valve inside this kit. It's got a really nice description selection table here. It's got, uh, it shows you how to do superheat adjustments correctly. And another nice thing is it actually shows you the amount of change that you get with every turn of the adjustment, which is really nice. They make R22 and R410A kits. This is an R410A kit because we're working on an R410A system. It describes everything really well. So it's a nice, it's a nice kit to put on a truck. Um, and then you've got three different uh, kits for different tonnages. So if you look here, like this, this one here is the uh, four and a half to five ton. And then they've got the three and a half to four tons. And then you've got the smaller one one and a half to three tons, and that's the one we're gonna be using today. You open this up, you've got the valve, obviously the sensing bulb, external equalizer, and then you've got an assortment of different fittings here for connecting in different applications, as well as a, a nice little instructions that show you uh, not only how to install it, but also how to set the superheat and some other nice things, which we'll, we'll show as we kind of go through the process. So you can see this has a piston installed 70 piston but the condenser shows that this should have txv if you look at the data tag and so we are replacing this piston assembly with the danfoss tr6 kit we're going to use the three ton expansion valve because this unit is a three ton unit i don't know if you can read that 036 unit we are using this universal tr6 kit so currently, refrigerant comes down liquid line into the piston assembly. This is where it's restricted, and then it boils in the evaporator coil. We don't have currently any port for the external equalizer, so we're going to have to make that. We're going to have to mount the bulb here. Um, you know, obviously, there's a lot of instructions about ideal locations for mounting bulbs and ports and all that kind of stuff. But, you know, in the field, in reality, in a lot of cases, you're pretty limited. We can't go into the aluminum here. We have... Uh, <clears throat> our tubes coming off of our evaporator suction header right here. So that's going to be limited. So we really only have this point right here other than if we wanted to run it outside the cabinet. But as soon as you run it outside the cabinet, then it's exposed. I want to test the performance of the system before and after and just see what we get. Um, obviously, uh, an installing an expansion valve, you don't only do it because of performance. That's not the only reason. Because in fact, if you flood a coil in low ambient conditions, you'll actually get more capacity out of it. So part of the job of the expansion valve is to prevent flooding the coil, prevent running liquid boiling refrigerant down the suction line and damaging the system. So I don't know that necessarily under these ambient conditions we're going to see a huge difference um, with the system once we put the TXV in, but it's just a, a, a nice exercise. So I'm going to go ahead and use my handy dandy Testo 605i's, two of them, to do get some uh, readings from the system and just see how we're performing. So I'm just going to use a uh, half inch drill bit. I just do it by hand. The nice thing about using a drill bit and duckboard. Uh, is that if you feed it in, it'll actually pull the duckboard out and won't end up shoving duckboard into the system, which is a good thing. So, let's go like this. All right, so I'm just checking both of the, both of the 605 eyes. The system is off, so just seeing if they're you know in the similar in a similar range. If I wanted to really make, I've already checked the calibration on these before, but if I really wanted to check, I would take them both and put them in an airstream right next to each other. Um, but just so you know what you're reading when you first open this up, you've got dry bulb temperature, relative humidity percentage, degrees Fahrenheit TD, which degrees Fahrenheit TD, I, I always was wondering what is that temperature difference or whatever, but it actually means temperature dew point. So this is actually the dew point temperature. And then uh, wet bulb. And so we have two of them, and so they're compared to each other. Once we get the system running, we'll be able to use it in um, what they call cooling heating power mode we'll be able to actually figure out what the BTUs are. We got to enter the CFM, so I'm going to look up the chart on this and kind of see where we stand. This has a, an X13 motor, I believe. I need to confirm that, but um, if it has an X13 motor, it should be pretty easy to calculate the CFM output. 
So we figured out it's you know, around 1050, it's 350 CFM per ton, um, which means that we're putting out 31,500-ish BTUs. It hasn't been running very long, so it's gonna need to run longer to really see what we got, which is why our, our supplier, RH, is gonna slowly creep up the longer it runs, but we've got about a 20 degree Delta T right now. So, you know, from a just a summary glance at it, it looks like we're doing okay. But we're gonna go ahead and uh, check the charge outside and see what we've got out there as well. And uh, that'll give us a good baseline to compare to when we put the TXV in. If you look here at this data tag, you can see that it says indoor TXV subcooling 12 degrees and metering device indoor TXV. But we don't have a TXV, we have a piston when we're putting in a TXV because we're cool like that. seals inside the caps too, whenever I pull caps off. Alright, so the Testo 550s are set to um, R410A. We've got a 41 degree evaporator temperature, 120 PSI, a 94.3 degree condensing temperature. On this system, I would expect it to be about, your condensing temperature to about, be about 20 degrees over ambient, which is about right, we're probably right about 75, maybe a little warmer than that, but between 15 and 20 degrees over ambient, which is appropriate. And that's our head pressure. Let's go ahead and check the superheat and subcool. So our superheat is currently at 7.8. And our subcool is about three. We haven't run real long yet, so we're gonna we'll let it run for five minutes or so and check it again. But really, our, our superheat right now in our current conditions is pretty good. I mean, it's about what we're gonna see once we put the TXV in. All right, so we're gonna pump down the system. Um, as soon as we pump it down, we're gonna put it under uh, nitrogen pressure. I'm under the brace setting on my regulator. That way, as soon as we disconnect the fitting on the piston system, we can go ahead and hook the TXV right up to it without contaminating any of the lines with humidity, air, or anything like that. Because if nitrogen be coming out, ain't nowhere getting in. Absolutely. Makes for easier vacuum and not getting crap in the system. So we're just gonna pump it down real quick. Good to go. All right, so we're gonna go ahead and recover the remaining refrigerant out of the system. So we got a clean tank, a recovery machine. I'm gonna bleed out the air real quick. Good, and then I'll open up the tank at that point. Yeah. Jump straight off the vacuum, we just got it recovered into the recovery tank. So I'm gonna hook it up immediately to our nitrogen tank. And then put it to the braze portion and then turn that on. Okay, so now that's gonna pressurize uh, the system with nitrogen. Um, and uh, so when we take it out and remove the piston to replace it with the new TXV, it's gonna be under positive pressure with nitrogen.
Oh, you got you got like six psi. Is this, is, you got, is this on right now? Six psi. Of what? You got a couple, little bit of nitrogen in there. Okay, good. Is it on, is it actually on actively? Yeah, it's right. So like it's all right, cool. So as we cut this sucker loose, it's going to actually allow a small flow of nitrogen to escape. Which is good. See, this is a perfect. This is perfect for a speed up sequence. So we are ready to rock and roll. A little snug in here. Snug as a bug in a rug. So that is nitrogen. So let's see what we got here. We have a 70 piston, which is what it said it had, coincidentally, which is good. So with a with a piston, which is something worth noting, you see this this te different pistons have different sealing configurations. This actually has a Teflon seal on both sides, but on a heat pump with a piston, it flows one direction, and then when it flows the opposite direction, it unseats, and the refrigerants are out, al allowed to flow around the outside. So in one direction, it's restricted. The other direction, it uh, unseats and becomes unrestricted, which is Kind of cool. They go by a lot of different names. They used to call them accurators, pistons, fixed orifices. I'm sure there's some other names that I don't know. But when a piston, a lot of guys will say, oh, the pistons fail. Pistons don't fail. It's a hunk of brass. You know, just It can get clogged, so it can get stuff down in, in the hole there, or it can become impeded or stuck, but it doesn't fail. Instead of trying to work in here, because we're going to have to run this straight into the valve, we're going to actually sweat in the copper. Um, as opposed to doing an adapter on the base, we're going to use an adapter here, but we're just going to sweat straight in. I'm just going to, we're just going to cut it back here and, and make a whole new, a whole new piece. All right, so we're going to go ahead and I should have just cut it back here initially, but we're going to cut this line dryer out. Whenever you remove a line dryer, it's always better. This is just sort of general knowledge. It's always better to cut it out than to sweat it out because when you sweat it out and you heat the dryer, you release whatever crap it's caught. I'm cleaning it, and this is one of the trickiest parts of doing these types of kits because you have to add in. Obviously, if you're replacing a TXV with a TXV, you've already got a, a point to connect your external equalizer. External equalizer is one of the most confusing terms in the industry because people think it has something to do with equalizing the refrigerant, but it doesn't at all. It's actually the pressure measurement point for calculating superheat, and it just does it using the uh, using the pressure of the refrigerant in the bulb in relationship to the pressure of the refrigerant in the actual suction line. So this is kind of tricky, but the best way to do this is to use a file. Use the edge of a file, use that to kind of cut into the copper without cutting all the way through the copper, and then use a scratch all to make the final bit. You can use a scratch all, or some people use a nail set, or different ways of doing it. I don't like using a drill because if you use a drill, then you can let shavings get into the copper, and that's obviously a bad thing. So I'm going to prevent that from happening. Here we go, let's give this a shot. So we got a nice little groove in here. It's kind of hard to see. But that helps the keep the uh, all from walking. So, but you see, like, if I tried to do this just on a regular copper line, it's really hard when you put that groove in there. It really sets It's it. really just for a place to hold the... Correct. Okay. Just kind of get it in deep enough that it can, that it kind of... Yeah. yeah. So, because, I mean, doing it on the actual curve of the copper is, is I mean, you could do it, but this is... A little bit easier. Safer, more accurate. Yeah. 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 See? Oh, yeah. Yeah, we got, so we got the valve. We got the um, air equipped fitting. Air equipped. And then we have a flare assembly, an actual male flare. And then we've got the chat lift fitting. We're using the chat lift for this. So we're going to sweat in the inlet 
here and you can see this has got an arrow on it so it shows you this is the inlet I'm going to sweat that in and then coming out here we're going to connect in the chaliff Yeah, it looks pretty good. So I have to solder this little piece into the outlet of the valve, but you gotta leave the Teflon O-ring off when you do that, otherwise you will melt the Teflon O-ring and then it will not seal. So we're also gonna use a little bit of nylog on the threads as well, to, it's just a nice assembly lubricant to make sure it snugs down, but it's a Teflon O-ring that really does the work of sealing it in a chatlet fitting. One cool thing about this strap that they ship is it's got the different uh, copper sizes right on it. It doesn't have holes in it, it just slides in and then you tension it. Uh, but it's pretty cool because in this particular case we've got um, three quarter inch copper. And so this is the line that we go to and we know we've got the exact right tension. Alright, so I got the, I got the uh, sensing bulb strapped on the side is where they show it, so that's where I put it. But technically it would, it would be fine on the top too. It's not going to make a huge difference. I've already got the Schrader core out of the external equalizer. And we don't need a Schrader core in it because this doesn't have a core depressor. So definitely need to make the core, get the core out, otherwise it won't work. That's a common mistake on these. I'm going to go ahead and insulate the bulb now with this foam tape that they send with it. This foam tape, going to insulate that up and uh, getting close. All right, so we've got it in place now. I don't have the, um, the chat lift tightened down yet until we get it all sweated in. Uh, but we've got the external equalizer in. We've got the sensing bulb in place with the uh, the line is I, I kind of made sure that it's in a place that's not going to rub against anything before we get done I'm going to take and you know zip tie things together and make sure that nothing's going to rub or vibrate check all these tubes make sure nothing's going to rub or vibrate put foam tape in between and zip tie it together if there's anything that's an issue now and a lot of the OEMs they don't all necessarily insulate the sensing bulb it's not 100% necessary, but it does help give you a more accurate superheat and in this in this exercise We're wanting to get as accurate as we possibly can So we just got to finish sweating this in which we're going to do now We're going to put the line dryer here close to the air handler, which is the optimum location to protect the new expansion valve we actually have uh, Nitrogen blowing out the end here right now because we still got the nitrogen on the braze setting and uh, we've got the one-way filter dryer because it's not a heat pump this is straight cool that we're gonna mount in and Finish this up, and then we're going to be ready to do a pressure test, standing pressure test, do some bubbles, especially on the uh, on the threaded connections. We did a good visual inspection on all of the sweat joints to make sure that we got a good fillet on everything, and then we will go to doing our evacuation. 154.3 on the suction is what I'm primarily going to watch. There'll be a little bit of equalization and fluctuation with temperature, but should be should stay right in that zone. So we're going to let that hold for a while, a standing pressure test, bubble test the, the actual threaded connections and see what we get. Looking good. I just have to do the, just let it stand for a while and see how it, see how it looks in the standing pressure test. Oh. So we've been holding now at 154 for 20, 25 minutes or so, and uh, we're ready to go ahead and pull our vacuum. So I got to attach the core remover tools on both sides, attach our great big hoses, vacuum rated hoses, micron gauge. Um, but I'm going to do that. I'm going to do that all now. All right, quick pause here. So we do not pull the vacuum through the gauges, even though these are a great set of gauges. All manifolds have some restriction in them, and we don't want to add that restriction to our vacuum. So our vacuum is, we're not going to remove the gauges. We're going to keep them here because we need them for when we're ready to set the charge. But the evacuation, the vacuum is going to be pulled directly, hoses to the system through core removal tools. So removing the core.
All right, so once we get to 300, then we will do the decay test. Our decay rate shows the rate at which it's rising, which is very low, definitely within the acceptable range. Okay, so we got the Schrader pins back in, we got our gauges hooked up. Right now, we got to set the charge. So, this particular unit, now that we have the TXV installed, is calling for a 12 degree subcool, which it shows right here on the data plate. So this outdoor unit was designed to have a TXV. The air handler did not have a TXV, it had a piston. We switched it to the TXV and we're gonna set the charge with 12 degrees of subcool. So we'll tighten up the service valve caps. And then here we have the right tank of recovered refrigerant that we uh, got from it. So right now we're at five degrees of subcool, which is this one here, so 5.4, and uh, we want to get it right at 12. So we're going to hook up here, open the tank up, bleed our hoses out, just to uh, clear it of any contaminants we have. So again, we're at 5.4 and uh, we want to see if we can, we're going to get that to 12. All right, so our Testo Smart Probe clamp, the 115i, is showing outside, we have a 65.5 re suction line temperature. Now we're gonna check it inside and see what type of difference we have because we've got a pretty good distance. And with superheat on an expansion valve, the expansion valve sets the superheat at the air handler, not at the condenser. So we're gonna check it inside, see what we get. So our return temperature is 75 degrees. You can see our suction line temperature is dropping well below what it is outside, which means that we do have some temperature rise on the suction line uh, from inside to outside, which accounts for the fact that we have a high-ish Super heat. Let's see what we're doing as far as delivered capacity goes. Let me turn on both of our 605Is. So this right here is the suction line temperature. This is the uh, return. This is the supply. So if you had a 21 degree delta T right now, our return is 51%, 55.6. Uh, as far as that goes, that looks pretty pretty standard. We're gonna to go to cooling and heating power. One thing to note is at this stage, we do have um, better capacity than we had before. Hey, you wanna adjust that TXV? Come on, no, there's nothing wrong with that. Oh, it's good here? Mm -hmm. Our delivered capacity is good. We have 40 saturation, what's the fine temp here? 54. Yeah, what's up? Go 14. Yeah, 14 degrees superheat. It's not, okay. definitely not outside of range. Because for these systems, you know, and again, we haven't run that long, but 14 degrees superheat, I'm not gonna adjust it, you know. So one of the questions that came up with this with this kit is, should you start adjusting an expansion valve? And my answer to that is don't do it unless you are well outside of range. In 14 degrees superheat, in this case now we're down to 13. It's, it's just, again, it just hasn't run long enough at this point for us to make that determination. Everything is within range. The delivery capacity is within range, delta T is within range, um, suction head, everything that we're looking for is within range. It's setting a good superheat here. Yes, it is higher outside, but it's not the TXC's job to set the superheat at the outside, it sets it at the inside. You can see now we're down to 50, 52.9. It's all it's all looking looking really good. So our, our subcool right now is what? Oh, uh, the subcool is 12.4. Okay, and the target on the condenser, because the condenser says that it, that it should be a TXV, the target at the condenser is 12. So again, we're gonna let it run another 10 minutes and just make sure, but at this stage, Everything is looking really good, and the advantages of a TXV are you control your uh, you control your capacity, the pounds of refrigerant that are entering the, the evaporator over a much wider range of conditions, and you take advantage of the ability to have a set subcool. And with a set subcool, that means that you're going to be closer to the coil temperature. You're already you've already dealt with a lot of that heat energy that's in the refrigerant. You've already dropped that down past the condensing temperature sufficiently. 
um, and you're, and you're going to operate it efficiently and safely for the equipment over a wider range of conditions because it's not going to flood the compressor. It's not going to um, cause those problems. Um, so everything, everything I'm seeing here looks good. Let's do one final test here of what we've got as far as capacity. Yeah, we're, we're still at 33,000. So you know, I would strongly encourage you to consider looking at the uh, Dan Foss Universal TR6 kit. It's a great kit, has great instructions. Um, if you did need to make an adjustment to your superheat, it tells you exactly how to do it and how many turns to make what adjustment. Uh, I would suggest getting uh, R410A and an R22 kit and either having it in, the, in your shop or on the, on the trucks in case you're in that situation where you need a, a good quality valve that will work on almost any residential and light commercial application. So I'm Brian Orr with HVAC School. Thanks for watching and we'll see you next time.